Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I, I just met uh, Gary. Uh, he's our speaker for this evening. He's from uh, Sun Valley, Idaho, and uh, seems to be a very nice gentleman. Gary? Thanks, Dennis. Hi, everyone. I'm Gary, alcoholic, and uh, I'm a drug addict and a compulsive gambler, and now I'm starting food. That's all right. I've been growing in the program. There's a couple of kind of preliminaries I want to get out of the way, Uh, and so uh, you'll those of you who are paying attention will be able to follow along, uh, hopefully, if I don't get too digressive. Uh, I just celebrated my 40th birthday a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I mention that because uh, I don't look 40 and I don't act 40. However, if you're adding up my experience and you're beginning to wonder, whoa, what's going on here? Did this guy start drinking when he was two? Uh, no, I just turned 40, and I uh, quit drinking when I was 28. And I started when I was 12. And so there's 16 years of drinking experience and uh, now almost a dozen years of uh, this. And uh, <laughs> or variations on a theme. And, and so uh, I'll want to talk about uh, partly what it was like, and certainly what happened, and uh, hopefully what it's like now. So... It was not that I was powerless over alcohol so much that got me. What got me was that my life was a mess. That's how it is that I I came to you people. I came to you people not because I had a drinking problem. Hell, my mother said to me many times, she says, Gary, you're a very poor drinker. I would immediately fill up two tumblers full of scotch and drink them and say, see, I'm a terrific drinker. And... uh, I had uh, I had those ideas about being a uh, two-fisted. Uh, I tell you, the, you know, really how 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 it was characterized was this way. I used I used to uh, read a lot of magazines, and I would see those Canadian club ads. You know, where the one where the helicopter is hovering over the volcano that's dormant, and there's all those green things, you know, and waterfalls, and and beautiful Tahitian ladies down there, and you come on this on this wire ladder rope hanging from the helicopter with a case of Canadian clubs smoking a uh, menthol cigarette. And uh, I imagined that's how it was going to be, or, or hanging off of uh, some uh, 40-foot sloop, you know, uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a sail, and rah, drinking, and, and, you know, having the good life. Well, <clears throat> so I didn't feel I had a drinking problem, and, and the number of times I'd been through, uh, boy therapies and counseling and, and interviews. I'd been uh, treated by psychiatrists. I'd been psychoanalyzed, scrutinized, and uh, otherwise. Uh, uh, even for a period of time, I was in a, I was in a, uh, a synanon environment. Uh, not synanon, I say that, that because you might understand that. I was in a place called ex which was a uh, they didn't call it a halfway house. They called it a hallway house. And uh, when you when you were admitted, you gave all your earthly possessions over. You signed them, and uh, and they immediately put you on welfare. And then uh, they took the check. And uh, <laughs> I wondered how it was the directors of this place all drove Cadillacs and Lincolns, and 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 us peons, we were out uh, collecting pop bottles and uh, and coat hangers. Uh, I spent some time there, not because I had a drinking problem, because I had a life problem. I went to see my aunt and my uncle and uh, to, to spend some time with them to get straightened around. Uh, my parents didn't seem to be doing a good job, and they had raised 16 kids, and they knew what it was about. And I went there to get my life straightened out. Uh, I, uh, I joined Boy Scouts. I went, to, uh, I went to other fraternal organizations. I joined bowling leagues. Uh, God, I, I, I played bridge. Uh, and then I turned to drugs. <laughs> Uh, better living through chemistry, right? Yeah. Uh, I, uh, 
I moved to San Francisco in uh, in 1964 and and, uh, and lived out near the Panhandle and learned uh, learned a lot about life and uh, possibly how I was going to make my way. So alternate lifestyles were really what it was about, and that's what it was about when I came here. It was you know, alternate lifestyle number 407. It was you know, another another way to try and change how it was with me. Um, I had clung to the belief that it was because my mommy took me off the tit too soon that I was, you know, the way I was. Uh, um, it, uh, you know, I, I had a lot of those ideas. I think I saw six or seven psychiatrists before all of this, through all of this. So an unmanageable life I was able to relate to. Not a drinking problem. It was a novel idea, actually, and, it, and I was introduced to it here that possibly there was some connection between all of the trouble I had been in for those 16 years of my life and booze. Oh, you mean, oh. And it it, it kind of entertained me at first, and, and I didn't really get onto it, and it took me a few weeks to uh, to get a desire to stop drinking uh, because it wasn't what it was about. I was here because uh, it was in November of 1972, and I had been... Uh, not too long out of the uh, ex Calais and had been uh, trying to straighten my life around. I hadn't I hadn't held a job. I was not I was not the kind of person who uh, who um, was gainfully employed for much uh, of, of my life. And uh, here I had come out of this place and I felt well, you know, obviously the thing to do, you know, this was alternate lifestyle number three hundred and something. And uh, what I had to do was carry a lunch bucket and then everything was going to be all right. Because uh, another piece of information for you is, is that I grew up in Canada, and uh, I, I, I lived in British Columbia, and um, it's a little bit different environment than, than, than California, either northern or southern California, and uh, I've since lived in both those places. Uh, so there I was. I'd, I'd spend a lot of time in, in the drinking establishments there, and there they're, uh, they're, they're not taverns. What they are is they're large emporiums. Uh, they're called beer parlors. And what they do is they just keep serving beer, and uh, all night long they serve beer, and all these loggers and miners and fishermen come in and stumble in. And uh, I used to watch uh, <clears throat> watch all of this go on, and I used to watch them cash their paychecks, and I said, aha, there's the answer. You know, I have to carry a lunch bucket and get a paycheck and come in here and cash it, and everything's going to be all right. And uh, and so I started to work for uh, Smith Wright Disposal Service, and... Uh, they were uh, they were in the garbage collection business, and uh, that was sort of my first job. I was 26 years old, and uh, <laughs> you know I had a brilliant career as a smuggler and dope peddler before that, you know, uh, and by that time had uh, managed to get a, a, a felony conviction and spend a few years in prison. So it uh, you know it was kind of a I thought an earthy start, you know, to a to a humble uh, <laughs> life and uh, you know changing my life and being all right, you know, uh, salt to the earth, and that was going to do it for me. So of course uh, I got my paychecks, and uh, of course I went into these uh, drinking places, these beer parlors on uh, on Friday, which was payday, and I cashed my two or three hundred dollar paycheck, which used to take me a week or two weeks to earn. And I God, God, when I was dealing dope, I could make that in two minutes. I didn't understand. There was some something wasn't right anyway in the scheme of things. And, uh, but anyway, here I was in there and it was gone. Like, you know, a couple of hours later it was gone and I was lucky to, uh, to have taxi fare back to wherever it was I happened to be living. And so, uh, unmanageable life. That's what it was. Unmanageable life. This, uh, time, because I had changed my life again and I had stopped associating with a lot of my old cronies, um, that is the people who were, uh, still doing what I'd done for several years, uh, selling dope or, or their bodies or uh, other people's bodies or other people's dope or uh, uh, <laughs> other people's radios, televisions, sports coats, cars, and all of that. Um, well, the guy's got to, you know, got to get ahead somehow. Right? So uh, here I had decided that really what I needed to do was to get a job, stop hanging around with those people, and everything's going to be all right. And and as I as I kept going in on Friday afternoons and blowing my two or three hundred dollar paychecks, I noticed that I kept sort of drifting back into those circles, and that I never really abandoned those playmates or those playpens. And 
And the more I kind of uh, was in that, the further I kept getting into it. And before you know it, I was just back where I had started from and uh, was drugged, crazed, and weirded out and uh, running with motorcycle gangs and doing stuff, and it was bad. So this one particular night in November... Uh, was running with the gang, and we went we went to one of these beer parlors, which was uh, down very close to the Indian Reserve, and uh, was well known for uh, for <laughs> it was well known. Uh, <laughs> and I was also well known there because I was uh, on their band list. You know, I was not permitted entry into this place, and uh, um, it so happened that this particular night, because I was somehow or other in the good graces of this of this motorcycle gang that I was running with. I guess I had some money. I don't know what it was, but at uh, uh, that particular night, they said, uh, when we got to the door, and they said, you guys can come in, but he can't. And uh, and they said, well, all right, if he can't come in, then nobody's coming in. We're going to tear a goddamn place apart. And uh, and so, uh, ooh, the, the management of the hotel, they said, well, okay, all right, just behave yourself, sit in the corner. And, uh, and so it was not too wild a night. Uh, there weren't too many fights or too much broken furniture. And, but as was usual, I ended up, I ended up in the, uh, in the drunk tank. That was sort of standard procedure on one of these deals. And, uh, so there I was in the drunk tank, and the next morning, I, I woke up, and I, I seemed to be alright. I, I, I recognized my surroundings, uh, and, uh, uh, I, I wasn't tattered nor torn, uh, so, or this was fine, so I was, I was released, and, uh, these were the enlightened times in 1972, right? Unlike the, the the decade before, where you used to get charged and you had to put up $10 bail and appear in court. Now they just kept you overnight and let you go. And um, and so here I was, cut loose in the morning, and uh, I was uh, out hitching a ride. And this this guy that uh, Art Tillotson, who had lived in the neighborhood, this old character, he was out driving around in his '64 black Comet with uh, with a, uh, a pint bottle of whiskey between his legs and a, and, a, and, a, and a six pack of beer down on the floor beside him and some more ammunition in the back seat and uh, he was up greeting the sun and uh, <laughs> so uh, he uh, he opened my eyes and uh, we went up to his house and uh, started you know, we started and and so what happened was uh, later on that afternoon after I had uh, uh, really gotten thirsty uh, I thought well obviously the thing to do is to go back down to the to the hotel where I had been the night before and get together with my friends that I'd been there with the night before and kind of find out what had happened. And uh, indeed, I went back and and got back together with these guys, and they were, of course, there later in the afternoon, and something happened, as indeed these things happen, and, and uh, certainly happened for me frequently. I insulted somebody, and so one of them uh, got up and... Uh, punched me in the nose and threw me down on the floor and jumped up and down on me and uh that that didn't that was that was okay and then but what what really got me was that the the, the owners of the hotel who had now seen aha he's not in their good graces anymore now we'll take care of him and so they used me to open up the door and uh, <laughs> and then they put me into a parked car uh head first like they were ushering me out out of this place and uh and so there i was uh got beat up by this motorcycle guy and then the owners of the hotel and i was laying in the street and then i got picked up by the police and i'd spent the night there the previous night there and uh i guess i had to hurled some abuse to them too because they took advantage of the situation and used <laughs> their flashlights and their uh blackjacks and so on and uh, and so i got beaten to within an inch of my life and uh it was uh, it was under those conditions that I said, yes, my life is a mess. I, <laughs> I, uh, still not making the connection to alcohol. Uh, it was it was playing with my caca when I was one and a half years old. Uh, that, that's what had done it. Uh, well, <clears throat> a phenomenal experience for me occurred when I regained consciousness after having uh, been beaten and such. Uh, I had an unusual experience, and it was a, a, an out-of-body experience, and it was it was kind of mind-blowing. And I realized that uh, that something was going on when when my consciousness was hovering in the corner of this cell, and my body was laying flat out on this piece of steel, and they were talking to each other, and I and I don't know where the hell I was, but uh, it was all sort of like a movie, and and uh, my eyes were, were both black and shut, and my nose was bent over here. My lips were fat, and 
my clothes were torn and my body was bruised and lumped and scratched and my head had big sores on it. And I asked myself this question and, and it's, it's, it's so, it's so vivid for me, this experience. I, I asked myself the question, well, I thought you went out to have a good time last night. Yeah. And, and how many times, uh, how often had that happened where I had been out with every intention of, of having a party and having a great time and getting it on and, and, and just being wonderful, you know, scintillating and all of that. And, uh, and there I was, another, you know, beat up, bruised, battered, and in jail. And how many times had that happened? And how many more times was it going to happen? And what was going to change it? And so, uh, under those conditions, I, I, I went to the only place at the time I, I felt that I could get any kind of safe information, and that was from my father. And I went, I went, and he and I had, uh, in the 14 years that, uh, since I turned 14 until I was 28, that 14 year period of time, I don't think we'd ever said two nice words to each other. I don't think we'd ever, um, we certainly haven't had any conversations, you know, it was a lot of rough stuff and there was a lot of violence involved and a lot of craziness and, and uh, bad feelings. And Nevertheless, I still felt in somewhere within me that, that if there was one safe place to get information, it would be from the person who sired me. And I, that was kind of my thinking. It was pretty basic uh, at that point. And he, uh, he saw the shape I was in and he knew, he knew what had been going on in my life and and so uh, he suggested that I might find some answers if I talked to this fellow who lived in the neighborhood. And, and that was Red Ross. And Red came next door and we talked. And, and Red suggested a couple things. Uh, one was that I was confused. <laughs> confused. Uh, <clears throat> I, the hot and burning issue was, uh, you know, who am I? You know, how did I get in this goddamn mess? I mean, on the planet. Uh, and, you know, pointing to my father. It's all your fault. And uh, uh, very sort of... Uh, strange feelings of alienation, didn't know why the hell I was here and who I was, where, where I was going, uh, that I was 28 years old and that, that, that it, it just kept adding up to a big fat zero and I, and I just didn't understand and everything I, tur- everything I touched turned to shit and when was it going to change and oh, woe is me. Red Ross said, he says, well, you're confused. He says, I know a place where you might get some answers. And he suggested that I attend one of these meetings and uh, I might find out. So I came under those conditions, realizing, as I had that morning in the jail cell, that my life was a mess, that it was just totally uh, twisted, and that that somehow something had to happen. And so after being around here for a while, I made the connection that there was an equation there, that every every time I drank, I got drunk, and every time I got drunk, I got into trouble. And that if I didn't drink, I wouldn't get drunk. And if I didn't get drunk, I wouldn't get into trouble. (laughs) Ding. (laughs) (laughs) Then I I came, that's when I came to believe that there was something. I came to believe that there was a power and that it existed. And I, and I experienced it. And I felt, I felt it when I came into these rooms and it was the power of good. And that's how I understood it. And that's how, that's how Red coached me. When he brought me to my first meeting, he says, look, he says, you come to this meeting, you'll hear these people and they'll talk about God. And, uh, and he says, I don't want you, I don't want you to be put off by that when they talk about God. And, uh, he says, all you gotta do is put another O in it and you will know what they're talking about. Just put another O in it and you will know what they're talking about. And, my experience is, I came in that door, and I walked into the room, and it was a room very much like this, and the people in it were very much like you, and their faces were shiny, and their eyes were glistening, and they wore nice clothes, and they, they smelled good. Oh God! <laughs> and they and they 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 shook my hand and they patted me on the shoulder and they looked me in the eye and they talked to me and they said, "Welcome. We're glad you're here." And I felt so good. I felt good. I felt welcome. I felt comfortable. Comfortable. And that was not my experience. Like the few days before, going into the Olympic Hotel as I did that place down by the Indian Reservation. You know, not welcomed, not comfortable. <laughs> yeah. And no matter how much I drank, still couldn't get feeling comfortable. And here, that was my experience. So I certainly did come to believe in power, and a power greater than myself, and that this power could get me thinking again in a kind of reasonable way. 
not normal. I mean, I wasn't looking for normality. That wasn't that wasn't it. I, I was looking to be at least thinking in some kind of uh, uh, reasonable way, and and certainly that is what goes on, uh, or what has gone on for me. And so, to turn my will and my life over to the care of this power was was essentially an easy task. I was I was schooled. I was guided. I was guided here in these rooms by attending these meetings and. In particular, by a man who, uh, a man who has since passed on, and his name was J.B. And J.B. was uh, uh, from uh, from Quebec, and he he spoke uh, he spoke Quebecois, and he was an interesting guy. And uh, he would oftentimes get up at a meeting, and he'd say, and he'd be talking about this power greater than himself. And, and about surrendering to this power, and he would say, he says, turn, turn it into this page. He says, how it's work, and uh, and he talk, he would read. He say, God, I offer myself to Thee to build with me and do with me as Thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self, that I may better do Thy will. Take away my difficulties, so that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of Thy power, Thy love, and Thy way of life. May I do Thy will. Always. And so I'd be sitting out there, and he'd be standing up at the front of the room, and, and he would read this. And I would, I would sit there, and I'd start vibrating, I'd start feeling this stuff, and I'd say, man, there really is a power, and it's greater than me, and it's here, and it's in this room, and I think I'm going to give up. But I wasn't going to give up in front of everybody. <laughs> so I took this book, and I went into... <laughs> the uh, smallest room in the house and I had locked the door behind me and I made sure that nobody else was home and I took this book and I went in there and I kind of made a little space and got down and I and I said, God, I offer myself to thee. And I recited the prayer. And since then, I've recited the prayer. Well, first it was alone and then amongst friends and now today I can I can recite it here in front of you and experience, once again, turning over my will and my life to the care of God as I understand Him. And it just keeps on working. It just keeps happening. And it's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. And so I stayed sober that way for uh, nearly five years. Nearly five years, coming to the meetings on the first three steps. Five years as a group secretary, as a group treasurer. Mm -mm -mm. One for you, one for me, one for you. I've since made amends. Uh, <laughs> but you see, I hadn't taken my fourth step. I hadn't, I hadn't searchingly and fearlessly inventoried that I was a thief. And uh, <laughs> I stayed sober for for that period of time. I. I I got married. Uh, you know, AA boy meets AA girl on AA campus. Uh, and uh, at, at first, I think I was four years sober, and she was four days, and, and it went like that. And, uh, and then after she was four months sober, we kind of came out of the closet. And then uh, by the time she was eight months sober, she was pregnant. And so, and so we got married. And uh, Well, her grandmother held a gun to my head. <laughs> Not quite, but it... Uh, it was just part of my experience, and, and it was out of that, out of that, that I finally took a fourth step <laughs> <laughs> while we were breaking up, uh, you know, which is hard to do. Uh, well, exactly. I, you know, I gave you that information. Uh, I was a beatnik for a while too, which um, breaking up was uh, that that whole deal, and and doing my fourth step, you know, out of. This is this has been my experience too. That in surrendering to this power greater than myself, and subsequently coming to know myself, I have discovered that under all conditions, I can a remain sober, and b that I can find something of value in all of my experience. And that experience was a seemingly bad experience. And and for two years after, I, I was in I was in a, 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 a turmoil, emotional upheaval, and. Uh, uh, the pregnancy turned out poorly. The baby died, and there were there were tremendous complications in the pregnancy, and uh, and we did not handle that uh, tragedy well. We did not communicate about that, and and subsequently the relationship deteriorated, and we uh, 
we just uh, separated and it, it just didn't work out. What, uh, what's, what's going on today for her and I is that we are able to uh, talk to one another. It's been several years now and uh, after four or five years we has reestablished communication and we are uh, each other's friend. God, I used to get sick when divorced people told me that. Oh, yes, my ex is my best friend. Mm. Just made me want to puke. <laughs> well, I'm not saying she's my best friend today. I'm saying that we are friends, and, and that's that's uh, been a tremendous uh, experience. And, and we have since been able to share the tragedy of our of our son's death and, and all that. Um, just prior to that, my father died. He was killed in, a, in an accident, and uh, uh, he was in a boat that uh, uh, was in a collision, and uh, my father and I, after I got sober, we reestablished a, uh, a relationship. And and in that two years that, that I was sober and before he died, he and I were able to share some things. Uh, not much. Not deep or significant or meaningful things. Just uh, day-to-day stuff. Hi, how are you? you know, Which... Uh, was a pretty big change considering the 14 years of war we had had. You know, he uh, he had broken my jaw uh, in three places one time. He uh, busted a two by four over my head, gave me a concussion, and uh, he sent me to the hospital a few times. And uh, um, and and I and I, and I had uh, 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 dragged the family name through the mud. <laughs> I mean, that was the only way I could get back at the big son of a bitch. You know, I mean. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, my best in my drinking days, I was 120 pounds, you know, uh, two foot reach, you know. So, uh, so I packed a gun. That was that was interesting. Uh, in uh, in inventorying those parts of myself that I found hard to look at, it uh, it had for me a lot to do with relationships: the relationship with my father, the relationship with my mother. The relationships I had in the community, those relationships I had with uh, uh, with lovers and close ones, relations, family. Uh, my behavior uh, had been uh, extreme, and I was able to see that when I sat down with a pencil and a piece of paper and and started to look at how I had been uh, as a social person. Uh, the uh, In the 12 and 12, there's there's tremendous uh, there's a, a tremendous there's a tremendous group of essays about the human condition, and there's a thread that runs through those essays that Bill wrote uh, a number of years after he had uh, been sober and in AA. That talks about those those areas of our life, uh, our sexual behavior, uh, our social behavior, and uh, sex, society, and uh, what's the other one? Help. Um, come again? Security. Security. Uh, sex, society, and security. And my sexual behavior had been very extreme. And uh, it, uh, uh, it had been all through my drinking life. And it, 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 even into my early sobriety. And, uh, oh, oh. I'm, aware of, I'm aware of myself as a sexual person as a result of taking my inventory. Uh, I am aware of myself as, in terms of my attitudes towards society as a result of my inventory. Uh, I, I had uh, for years uh, been uh, a proponent of overthrowing governments and uh, uh, putting LSD in the water supply and uh, you know armed revolt and installing installing poets and artists and philosophers and, and you know out with the politicians and. And that, uh, that, of course, had all gone on around these tables and these drinking establishments. I mean, it never got any further than that, you know. It was, uh, you know, let's have, another, let's have another bottle of wine and we'll talk about it some more. Uh, so I could see myself, how I had been socially and how I interacted and what had gone on and, and how I had felt a victim when I had been put in prison and, uh, and how my behavior uh, in community reflected uh, not only on my family but... Uh, in the community as a whole, I, uh, I tore around, I tore around, I terrorized and uh, drank and drugged and and was generally very, very uh, antisocial. So uh, 
And in terms of security, I mentioned I carried a gun, and that that that's unusual in Canada. It's uh, uh, it's, it's damned unusual. <laughs> and so uh, uh, I had I'd found too that I that I in terms of in terms of my security needs that I had a lot of security needs, uh, and they 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 showed up in a lot of different ways. And uh, and doing an inventory, I was able to see how I had handled situations in the past. How I had behaved and what I could do differently, and where I could where I could make some effort with the help of this higher power to which I had surrendered to alter my responses, to alter uh, what had been set up as patterns for me. Uh, I mean, it was just used to, used to be so easy for me to string out a whole, just a whole. Uh, I mean, Lenny Bruce did not have a bad mouth by my standards. And or, or neither does Richard Pryor. When I was when I was involved with it with somebody some figure of authority, I mean I used just to string out this horrible stuff and just spill it out all over them because that was my response. And so I learned uh, to uh, to change how I would respond to in those situations <laughs> as a result of taking an inventory and not feeling you know the hackles on the back of my neck go up when whenever whenever the cops were around or whenever you know some. Some authority type person was you know and I was able to to sit down with the guy and talk to him about this. I was able to sit down with the guy and talk about how I had behaved sexually, how I had pandered, pimped, and prostituted myself and others, how I had been on the streets for sixteen years, how I had been since I'd gotten sober, you know, and how how the, the pursuit of the sex relation in the twelve by twelve the first question there are thirty questions in the twelve and twelve and the fourth step uh he 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 Noah was great with rhetoric. Also, he was meaningful and to the point. The first question is just how and where and and in a pers- in the selfish pursuit of the sex relation, who was hurt, how and who and where and when. First question in a series of 30 questions. And that to me is uh, is, is significant. And and so that that figured into my looking at myself, my sitting down with the guy who was at the time 25 years sober. And with whom I had worked and established a relationship, and was able to talk to him and tell him about how I had been, you know, how I had been in terms of of money, and how I had behaved about money, and how I had behaved in terms of of uh, my security needs and locking up doors and uh, and you know arming myself and putting bolts on doors and and uh, oh, all the stuff that I used to do, and uh, uh, having uh, you know six different bank accounts in different parts of the city and safety deposit boxes and oh crazy stuff. So uh, we talked about that, and we saw those patterns, and saw how I had been, and, and I was able to talk to him and tell him about that, and then to accept that, that, hey, this is who you are, this is how you've been, and this is the way you've responded, and what are you going to do about it? And I followed the next part of that step, which a lot of people omit. I admitted to God that this is who I am, this is how I've been, and this is what I've done. And I said, my father, this is, this is me. And so, uh, it took me a while to get ready, though, to let go of some of that stuff. It took me another couple of years of hanging on to that stuff. I said, okay, this is who I am. This is how I've been. But I wasn't ready at that point to do much about it in terms of being entirely ready to have God remove these defects of character. Because some of those behaviors I enjoyed and I continued to enjoy. And, uh, and, and for all of those early years in Alcoholics Anonymous, I had held on to the mistaken belief that what I was doing here was becoming a good, <laughs> a good and virtuous person. <laughs> oh, very nice. I, I had, I had mistaken these these principles of Alcoholics Anonymous and this idea of spirituality for holiness. Holiness. And here I was thinking I was in the pursuit of some holy grail, some holy ideal, some marvelous missionary evangelical doodah. <laughs> Didn't understand that what was happening was is that I had a disease and that I was here for treatment. You know, I had my head so full of this stuff, oh, I'm a bad person and I'm here and I'm trying to get good. 
I was here for treatment from alcoholism. And as a byproduct of my treatment for alcoholism, I have developed some of the other sides of my personality which had never been given very much play, like my integrity, like my honesty. All of that stuff that had taken second seat you know, to my lust and my greed and all those other parts of my personality. And so now there's the beginning of shift. There's a beginning and there's a, there's a difference being made in terms of my interaction with you and with those people out there. And so by this time, I had, uh, I had uh, healed somewhat and was able to hold down a job. Uh, the first couple of years, mainly, I, uh, I hung out at the alarm club and uh, I washed ashtrays and, and the urinals and uh, swept up the floor and stuff like that. And, and that's, that's what I was capable of doing. I, I remained unemployable for a period of time in my early sobriety. And in my very early sobriety, the best I could do was ride my bicycle uh, five or six hours a day, eat my meals, go to my meetings, and sleep. And, uh, and that was it. And that went on for eight months. So, to get entirely ready, though, for God to remove my defects of character meant, just as it had meant for me to accept that I was powerless over alcohol and for me to uh, <clears throat> somehow be infused with the desire to stop drinking, I had to be up against the wall with my knees buckling. And that's how That was the position. That's the position wherein I will finally move and finally do something. And that is the position where I found myself entirely ready <laughs> for God to remove these defects of character. Please. And I humbly asked him. I'd done some work to, uh, to get together with the people that I felt that I had harmed. And in, in my early attempts at a fourth step, I had created large lists. That is, before, at about five years, when I did my essential <coughs> fourth step, I had attempted a fourth step. And in my attempts for a fourth step, I had developed enormous schemata of <clears throat> family trees and relationships and all the kids in my grade one class and all of their friends and family and parents and cousins and so on. And uh, in grade, my, you know, second grade, I mean, you know, kindergarten, right through grade 12. And, uh, you know, I was inventorying all of these uh, esoteric relationships. And so by the time I was finished, I had about 900 names on a sheet of paper, you know, a computer printout paper, you know, that fold, <laughs> folds up. You know? And... Uh, <clears throat> You know, that was my first attempt at a fourth step. So uh, I had established some lists early on, and uh, it allowed me to uh, to see that there were indeed people whose lives I had affected. It allowed me to see and to uh, uh, somehow analyze that there had been uh, people harmed, uh, either directly or indirectly, by how I had been and who I had been, and what was I going to do about it. Um, interesting circumstance here. Uh, I'm visiting in Las Gatas, and I'm staying at uh, uh, Relations Place, an aunt and uncle's place here. And coincidentally, a cousin who lived next door to uh, to where I lived, Red Ross lived on one side, we lived on the other, and another uncle and some cousins lived on this side. Well, one of the cousins, who has been in Australia now for two out of the last three years, uh, is now in Las Gatas returning from Australia via California to British Columbia. And she, who is now a young lady, and I shared yesterday uh, her remembrance of me. Uh, I'm 17 years older than her, 15 years older than her. And uh, so I, it was interesting because... She described a time, and I was and I was able to fix this time. It was 1967, and uh, <clears throat> I had uh, I had just been released from two years in prison, uh, two years in prison with this tremendous plan that I'd given the parole board for uh, becoming a new human being, and uh, had fucked up on immediately. And I was I mean I wasn't out the door. I mean God, I wasn't out the door with this wonderful plan and all these great things I was going to do. And, uh, I mean, one of, you know, early on when you're out of jail after two years, you think, you know, you want to get close to someone, you know, smells good, feels good, you want to do that. 
You want to have some food that tastes good. You want some real food, homemade food. You know, there's a number of things you want to do. You want to go see places. I got drunk. I got drunk. I mean, you know, it was the first thing I did. I got drunk. I didn't get laid. I didn't have anything to eat. You know, I puked. I just got drunk. So, uh, I mean, that should have told me something back in 67. So anyway, my cousin was relating to me uh, yesterday how how she remembered me when she was a, a child of seven years old. And uh, uh, she had come, uh, her and her brother and her sister, they were playing Martians, and they had these little silver squirt guns. And uh, she was telling me this story, and I was... Uh, I was on the the uh, the, uh, the terrace, the the, the, the uh, veranda, the patio out behind my parents' house, and uh, God knows what I was doing. I might have been shooting up for all I know. Uh, in any case, these little these little urchins, you know, seven, five, and three, you know, they sneak up behind me, pretending they're Martians, and <laughs> and I apparently reacted, uh, overreacted to all of this, and uh, and that, and I and I, I I apparently said something to her. And uh, and so for the next ten years, she never came next door to see my mom and dad, you know, that, cause of, <laughs> for fear that I would be there. And uh, and and so she never made it on my list. And yet, as God would have it, she and I were able to talk about that yesterday, and I was able to make an amends to her yesterday, and we were able to hug and kiss and experience each other in, in this new life that you and the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and God makes possible for people like me and you. And isn't it wonderful? Yeah. I overdosed on drugs six times. I have a broken bone here in my uh, uh, sternum from a uh, from, uh, uh, a friend, a woman, who had uh, pounded on my chest to revive me. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> <laughs> yeah, the old heart going. Uh, all she had to do was give me a drink. I would have got going, you know. <laughs> so, so many, so many near misses, automobiles, uh, syringes, bullets flying by my head, enraged husbands, uh, bad dope deals, uh, knives, and all of that stuff. Uh, I got scars and... Uh, I mean, I, you know that, you know the 20 questions? There's a part in the 20 questions that says, sought out lower companions. A lot of you guys were looking for me. <laughs> uh, and that, uh, uh, how that's changed and, and how all of those times, which were, which were, you would think, you would think, just, you know, numbers up and wasn't and hasn't been has to be in my mind for some reason. And part of that reason is for me to sit down on, on some lawn furniture at my uncle's place yesterday next to the pool and talk to my cousin who just flew in from Australia and who happens to be here at the same time I am to tell me about the time that I behaved like an ogre and she was seven years old and still remembers it and that's how she thought I was. So, I don't feel that I ever got my eighth step list down perfectly. I know that one time I did an eighth step list and I had three names on it. That's a mistake. <laughs> but then I wasn't very honest at that time and I have discovered that I have become increasingly honest and, and, and more able to digest about myself as it says in this book. If you have already made a decision and an inventory of your grosser handicaps, you have made a good beginning. That being so, you have swallowed and digested some big chunks of truth about yourself. And that's, that's, what's, that's what's gone on. And that's what continues to go on. And so, wherever possible, I, I, I make those amends. And I feel terrific. I feel awfully good. I feel... Actually, now that I'm over the hump of 40, I feel better than I have felt, God almighty, for, I bet, I mean, years. I got to tell you, though, the last four or five months that I was 39, I was a little anxious. I was a little, uh, I was, I was a little worried. And, uh, and so I had, I had, I don't know, I had, I had a difficult time approaching 40. 
And 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 now now that nothing happened, it was just another day, and I <laughs> God, I just I don't know if something happened. It's just gotten better and better and better. Part of uh, part of what that's about is is that I have uh, continued to take that inventory. I took another fourth step in February. I was down in San Diego, and I took a fourth step, and a fifth step, and a sixth step, and a seventh step, and an eighth step, and a ninth step in February. And and that's because I continue to take personal inventory. And occasionally when I'm wrong, I admit it after a while. <laughs> the, uh, the contact I've enjoyed with the power greater than myself, I have discovered for me, is strengthened by attending meetings. That no matter what, no matter what political bullshit is going on, no matter what personality, intra, infrastructure, whack, 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 bullshit is going on, no matter what's happening in terms of the content of the meeting and who's saying what or who's doing what with whom to and how and all of that, it doesn't matter because here is where I got connected and here is where I get reconnected and here is where I affirm and reaffirm that in my life there is a power. It's greater than myself. I give up to this power and I come to these meetings and I know that power. And I enjoy and share that power. I live that power in my life as best I can. And I get refueled here. I get charged here. I get enthused here. And occasionally I get a little... But I'll tell you something. <laughs> Seriously, I have been to over 4,000 meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, I, and for a period of time, I was a convention junkie. I mean, I, I flew to a convention in Mexico City. I flew, and from there, I went over to Honolulu. I went to a convention there. And then I was out to, out to New York for the International Conference of Young People. And then you know, I think I'm going to go next week out to Chicago. There's an international conference out there. And anyway... Out of those thousands of meetings, I, I three maybe, maybe three meetings, I, I, I did not feel better as a result of going to those meetings. I always feel better after the meeting. I mean, that's, I mean, I, mean, you can, I, I don't know. I mean, that's pretty convincing for me. I come into a meeting, I'm in a certain frame, and then I leave a meeting and I'm in another frame. And it's always, a, for me, a better frame, except for a couple times. So I keep coming back. Uh, I get connected to that power greater than myself. Occasionally I can meditate in a meeting. I'm, you know, uh, and that's okay. The principles of the, the program of Alcoholics Anonymous are, I believe, elusive. The principles of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I believe, are not spelled out. The principles, I believe, are a body of knowledge that needs to be absorbed and experienced and can only be absorbed and experienced by association with members of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous who know what the hell they're talking about and what they've been through. I, 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 I got here and I was welcomed and I was made to feel comfortable and I was listening to people who were talking the language that I understood. The seven psychiatrists I'd been to, the counselors, the halfway houses, the people in the jail and the intake, the lawyers and the nurses and all these other guys that I'd talked to, they weren't getting through to me. I got here, you were talking to me, and you were making sense. And the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous are understood by the men and women of Alcoholics Anonymous who practice these principles in all of their affairs. And so... Essentially, for me, it was very important to read this book to get a hold of some of those ideas. For me, it was important to read this book to learn how to pray. I didn't know how to pray. I found, as I as I quoted a prayer in there that I was able to I was able to use. I found that there are other prayers in there that I've been able to use. <coughs> that, as a result of all of this, I am not dead. I'm not dying. I'm not unconscious, that as a result of all this, I am alive, I am living, and I am conscious, and I am aware. And that is a tremendous, tremendous gift that you have given me, Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, this gift, and I am grateful, and thank you for letting me share.
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.